Gentlemen, if we haven't met before, my name is Pastor Ben Tiffey and it is my absolute joy and privilege both to welcome you here today and to be uh, solemnising this wonderful occasion as we witness and together see the swapping of rings and vows and kisses of this stunning bride, Justine Hugh, and this handsome groom, Thomas David Hines Gilliland. <laughs> I have to tell you, this is just such a wonderful occasion. I've known these two young people for many years and uh, I remember the day I saw Tom Gilliland breaking out a brand new flannelette shirt. <laughs> he washed his jeans, he, he scuff whited his brand new Dunlop volleys and I said, there must be a young lady in your life, Tom. And little did I know it would be Justine. She came with her, she polished her Dr. Martin's boots. Dude, I did. And she put a new blue tint in her hair. And uh, here we are now, you've walked down the aisle. Isn't this awesome? Yes. Well, friends, today we are gathered here to celebrate the joining in holy matrimony of Tom and Justine. We're here as their family and their friends and their community of faith to witness their joining together and to love them, to pray for them, to pray with them and to support them as they build from today onwards a God-honouring Christian marriage. The Bible teaches us that in the beginning God made the heavens and the earth and everything that God made, he said, it's good. He looked at it and he proclaimed innate goodness over everything. Then it says that God made a human being and placed him in the middle of this wonderful creation. And he made that human being as a steward, as a vice regent. He gave him charge over it to care for, to manage, to look after. 
And then when God put that human steward, Tom, in the garden, he said, this is very good. His name wasn't Tom, just threw that in there for you. <laughs> he said it was very good. And then the Bible says a curious thing, that there's only one thing when God made everything, there's one thing that God said is not good. And that is he looked and he saw the man on his own. Now, all the old wise heads that are in this room today know it's never a good thing when a man has time on his own, is it? It's always innately probably, you can hear the women laughing louder than the men on that one. So God's solution was this, that he put Adam into a deep sleep and from his side he removed a rib. He didn't do it from his feet to build something below him. He didn't take an ear bone out, mainly because they don't exist, but also because it wasn't something above him. He took it from the rib. He took something from his side to create someone who would stand by the man's side, not as a servant or as a slave, or, or anything else, but as a companion in life, a partner. The Bible says God made the woman as someone who would correspond to him. And it says that Adam looked upon Eve and he said, whoa, man, and that was what she became known as, a woman. <laughs> he uttered the first ever primeval marriage vow. He said, this woman will become bone of my bone. She will become flesh of my flesh. The Bible says that the picture of human marriage is when a woman and a man come together in holy matrimony. They commit in a wonderful, God-centered covenant to live together, to love and to honor each other for the rest of their lives. And something as Christians, we believe, in a moment like today, something miraculous happens when Christians get married that once upon a time, Tom and Justine, you, you've lived your whole lives as Tom and Justine. Yep. <laughs> and today, something amazing is going to happen as you swap rings and you swap wedding vows today. God is going to perform a creative work, not just that you decide now, well, we live together and we share some stuff, but actually that the two would become one, the Bible says. And something amazing is happening today as you go from being Tom and Justine to Tom and Justine, a new, <laughs> brand new unit. So as Christians, we celebrate that too. The Bible tells us many times, it uses marriage, in fact, the two people coming together as a metaphor for the way God wants to relate to human community. And it tells us that when two people enter into a godly marriage, what they actually do, if it's done right, and we've all seen it not done right, when it's done right, it becomes a vehicle which reveals God to the human yeah. race. Yeah. The human race needs marriage done right. Yeah. It needs people who come together and live in and show human beings this is what God's love and God's plan looks like for human beings. And anyone else can feel free to put their mobile phones on silence so that we don't have that. I've got an important question for Ronnie and for Kwei Ling. Who gives this woman to be married to this man? We did. Yes, excellent. <laughs> Thanks, guys. I think they get a round of applause. They're getting one off their hands here. Now, family and friends and extended guests, I have an important question for you. And if you do, then your answer at the end of my asking you this question is also that you say, we do. We're going to have one practice. Are you ready? Do you? Yeah, we do. Oh, this is good, but that's not only a practice. This is the real question that I have for you. Do you as the family and friends and the faith community of Tom and Justine promise to support them, encourage them and pray for them and at all times seek to uphold them in upholding their promises of marriage, overcoming their challenges together and building a God-honouring, unifying Christian marriage. Yes. You do, that's good, that's good. Okay. There's no turning back from this point, you guys. Well, I have an important question for you two. First to you, Thomas, David, Hines, Gilliland. Do you take Justine Hugh to be your lawfully wedded wife? To live together according to the word of God in holy matrimony, do you promise to love her, comfort her and honour her? To keep her in sickness and in health, forsaking all others, and to keep yourself only for her as long as you both shall live? I definitely do. <laughs> Justine Hugh. Do you take Thomas David Hines Gilliland? to be your lawfully wedded husband? Do you promise to live together according to the word of God in holy matrimony? To comfort, love and honour him, to keep him in sickness and in health, forsaking all others and keep yourself 
only for him as long as you both shall live. I do. Excellent. Folks, if you're the praying kind today, then I would ask you to join me in a moment of prayer as we pray for Tom and Justine. This morning while they embark on this great thing called Christian marriage, we're going to be praying that the creator of the universe would make his presence felt both in all of our hearts and minds and in their lives and in their marriage, in the lives of all of the wonderful children that they will have as time goes on. <laughs> and that today the creator of the universe would be present and that his son Jesus would make his grace felt today so that we could be part of this wonderful occasion of building a Christian marriage. If you're the praying type, would you bow your heads? Heavenly Father, we thank you for Tom. We thank you for Justine. We thank you for the gift of love. We thank you for the gift of marriage. And today we pray as they swap vows and they swap rings that you would commence a wonderful, miraculous and creative grace-filled work of joining their lives together and walking with them for the rest of their days. In Jesus' name, we thank you for this. And everybody said, Amen. 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 <laughs> Tom and Justine have selected uh, one scripture passage which they wanted to be read at the outset as a, as a centering thought or a declaration as they embark on this voyage on the HMS matrimony today. And they chose a very interesting scripture verse. It comes from the New Testament and it comes from the book of Hebrews chapter 12 and it's the first three verses. I'm going to read them to you today. It says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders, the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race set out before us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, he scorned its shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. What an interesting thought. I wonder if you're like me and, and, and you're sitting there going, what has that got to do with Christian marriage? Well, it actually has a lot to do with it. And I think you guys have made an amazing choice in deciding at the outset of your marriage journey that you've chosen to reflect on the example of Jesus, who, although he never married, actually shows and teaches us more about something that builds and strengthens human marriages than yeah. any other point yeah. of reference we could discover under this sun. As you embark on your journey today, Tom and Justine, I want to encourage you to remember the words for the rest of your days that you've chosen to reflect on today, to fix your eyes on Jesus. Yeah. When we fix our eyes on Jesus, we learn loving service. We learn about washing feet. We learn about opening blind eyes. We learn about loving the unlovely. <laughs> <laughs> we learn about sacrifice. We learn about loving, self-giving and pouring out our lives to someone else. Uh, I want to share with you a, another scripture which I think should be stuck up in every Christian home. It comes from the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 4, verses 7 to 12. Listen to what it says. I saw something meaningless under the sun. There was a man all alone. And he had neither son nor brother, and there was no end to his turmoil, yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. For whom am I toiling? He asked. Why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? This is meaningless. Listen to this phrase. A miserable business. Two are better than one, because they have a good return for their labour. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone, Mr. T would say, pity the fool <laughs> who falls down with no one to help him up. Also, this is a secret, if two lie down together, they can keep each other warm. But how can someone keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. And a cord of three strands is not easily 
broken. Tom and Justine, before you swap bows, I want you to think with me for just a moment. And you guys are welcome to kind of eavesdrop on our very private conversation about marriage, if you like. Ecclesiastes celebrates the honour and dignity and the godliness of two people who come together in a lifelong covenant to join lives. But it also warns us that a man, a woman, a life lived alone is a miserable business. So today, as you embark on this journey, make sure that you don't become two solo individuals cohabiting in the same house and go back to a miserable business of a life lived alone. Yeah. A philosopher was once asked, what's marriage like? Is it like, I don't know, two planets that orbit around the sun? And he reflected deeply and someone said, what if it is neither that? What if marriage is a planet orbiting around the sun populated by two people who share their world together? And that's what you're invited into by scripture today, that you move to Marriageville, population, Tom and Justine. Two are better than one for a number of reasons the Bible gives us. Let me briefly summarise them for you. The first one is fruitfulness. They have a good return for their labour. They don't work alone. I want you to reflect today on the fact that the Bible says provoke one another to good works and that you can do so much more together than either of you could do alone. And those of us who know you and love you and journey with you, we see what an effective team you can both be. Batman and R Roberta. It's, <laughs> yes, Mulan, that's what it was. I wasn't gonna I wasn't gonna racially categorize in this moment in time. <laughs> the second reason is companionship. It says if one falls down, another can help him up. You know you need to spend your lives championing each other, don't you? Building each other up, helping each other up, holding each other accountable. The Bible says it's pitiable if someone falls and there's no one there to help them up. Don't kick each other down, press each other down. We've all seen marriages where they talk about their problems, they argue in public, you know, they kick the cat and then they kick each other. And today, you're, you're here to swap vows that say we're going to build each other up, restore each other. Yep. Companionship. I encourage you to practice the art of wiki marriage. Wiki marriage. The statistic is that Wikipedia, that great online encyclopedia, is actually, although we joke about it a lot, the world's most accurate encyclopedia. And the reason being because every user, every person who comes to Wikipedia can spot a fault or an error or something that needs clarification and they themselves can just log in and make that change. Mm. I encourage you to build a wiki marriage where all of the users in the system, that's just you two by the way, <laughs> all of the users in the system can make corrections, course corrections, spot improvements and make it continually grow in companionship. The next one is intimacy. It's, it says, if two lie down together, they can keep each other warm. Isn't that a great thought? And it poses the question, can one keep warm alone? I, I've actually talked some, and spent some time over the last little while with Tom and Justine and I, I really love and admire the, the intimacy that they have together. I asked them some questions. I asked them just to share me some information. So uh, Justine told me some things about you, Tom. <laughs> she told me there's one thing that makes her laugh about you. Just Only one? one? Nothing else. Wow. Okay, that's all she's giving you. And she's of all of the things it could be, do you want to have a guess what it was going to be? Oh. No. There's too many to choose from. She said, I love how expressive his eyebrows are. Yeah. And also his enthusiasm for random tangents. There you go. She said that something she values most about you is your love for God, which she thinks shines through in your vivacity for life and your love for other people. She loves that you treat every person that comes your way with respect and dignity and that you love getting to know people's hearts and will often talk for hours. <laughs> Is that true? <laughs> to anyone and everyone. She says you have some foibles related to what she just said. You will talk to anyone and everyone and whenever she wants to leave with you from a gathering, a party, a church, a shopping centre, the wheelie bin out the front. <laughs> that at any particular time she has to pretend that you're leaving at least an hour earlier <laughs> to give you time to take that amount of time to say goodbye to people. <laughs> but she did say this, that she is looking forward to growing up and growing old with you. Discovering more who you both are with people. Mm. Changing with each other, learning and seeing how God will use you together as a family to bless the lives of other people and to help build his kingdom. Isn't that awesome? That's what she thinks about you. Justine Toms was a little shorter, 
but he's a bloke, so his word count is more minimal than yours. I have to talk to people, I <laughs> He's too busy having conversation. Yeah. He, he said that what makes him laugh about you is that you seem really sweet and really small and really nice, <laughs> but you have no problem trash-talking someone. <laughs> Where's Rowan? <laughs> Now, for those of you that are wondering what trash talking is, you'd need to watch some basketball to get the hang of that one, okay? Or maybe just hang out with Justine and Tom at lunch. <laughs> he says that he loves and values most. If he could only say one thing, it would be your observations. Tom loves hearing your personal view on things and the way that you act out your personal view in certain situations. I did ask you to message me about the foibles that you saw, but Tom said, not foibles, I'm gonna talk about annoying weaknesses instead. <laughs> And he could only come up with one, and this is just a maybe, Tom, am I being faithful to represent you here? Correct. Just a maybe, a maybe, your lack of pop culture. <laughs> so we have taken the liberty out the back of having some Quentin Tarantino films delivered for you to watch over on the honeymoon, that'll be a good thing. Something that Tom looks forward to after you're getting married, he wants to just be there for you whenever you really need a hug and a word and spoken in not a text message for a change <laughs> of encouragement and hope. Isn't that good? Intimacy. Always keep it. Keep your marriage warm. Keep each other warm. The question, can one keep warm alone? It can be answered yes in our society because we live in a high-tech society. Now you can wear an electric blanket. <laughs> uh, you can put on a heater. And, and in the ancient world, what you needed is you needed to, and it's used as a metaphor here, to pool body heat with the other person to keep a warm life. Don't have an electric blanket marriage. Have a warm, let's put, later on, let pool body heat marriage. We're gonna move on, it's getting warm in here. The next one is security. It says one can be overpowered, but two can defend themselves. And you need to know there's such a blessing and a security in a unified husband and wife. Always guard your unity. Don't let anything drive a wedge. And the promises that your family and friends have made today is not to facilitate you driving a wedge in between each other. Oh, I know, I can't believe he said that. Oh, bro, I can't believe she said that. But to actually underscore your closeness as a couple and always drive you back to unity, even in the tough times. Mm. The last one is godliness, that a cord of three strands is not easily broken. So we've got cord of Tom, cord of Justine, and now God, the creator of the universe in his son Jesus says, not just that you're looking at each other saying, will you marry me? But he's looking at you going, will your marriage marry me? And will you involve Jesus in this journey? Tom, there's some good news about marriage for men. Right. The Bible says, wives, submit to your husbands. This is the bit where most of the women in the room usually want to kill me, Justine. The good news is this that Tom, you're charged with the leadership of your family and ministering to your wife. But Justine, it's not actually bad news, this passage that gets a bad rap. Because when you see that passage in its context and it points toward the example of Jesus, it says, husbands, love your wives like Jesus yeah. loved the church. He poured his life out for her. So Tom's leadership of the family, his ministry as a husband is not to call to become a pharaoh, making you build bricks without straw, or a domineering megalomaniac, reducing you to a life of unjust quiescence and servitude. But in fact, his job is to lay his life down for you, to pour it out for you, to take the bullets for you, to lift you up, always to seek to reconcile and redeem any broken areas of life. The Bible paints a picture, Tom, of a crucified saviour who paid the ultimate price for the people that he yeah. loved. And you today are injuncted by scripture to do the same thing for your beautiful bride. The commission on your life, pour your life out for your wife. And if you do that, you will find a warm, responsive, loving partner in crime for the rest of your days. Share your worlds together. Well, you two are gonna swap some vows if you think you still want to go on with this, which I'm taking a big guess saying, yeah. we do. Yeah. Tom, you're going to need this. <clears throat> Would you like to read your vows to Justine? Justine, you. I, Thomas David Hines Killerland, choose you. I choose you and no one else 
to be my lawfully wedded wife. Not just today, but for the rest of our life. I choose you, and I choose all of you. I choose your strengths, and I choose your weaknesses. I choose you today when you look so beautiful that you make gardens look dull. And I choose you tomorrow when your eyes are bloodshot, your nose is running, and your, your hair looks like tumbleweed. I still choose you then. I choose you when everything works right. And I choose you when nothing does. I choose you whether we are rich or poor, or we are healthy or sick. Whether your mood is good or bad, I choose to love you as my wife with everything I have. I choose to honour you with my thoughts, dignify you with my words, and support you with my actions. I choose to build you up and not pull you down. I choose to treasure you in those moments where we're snuggled up with sunsets and violins, but I also choose to treasure you in those moments of intense disagreement and conflict, knowing that this marriage is my goal and you are my prize. I choose to be a better husband to you day after day, year after year, until I have no time left. As of today, I declare this choice as a solemn promise before God who taught me real love and this assembly of witnesses who all know where I live. <laughs> Justine, would you like to read to Tommy Oldhouse? I, Justine Hugh, take you, Thomas Gilliland, David Hines Gilliland, to be my lawfully wedded husband. Before God, our family and friends, I proclaim with both gladness and solemnity. From this day onwards, I am committed for life to loving you with all that I am, drawing on my understanding of the way that God loves you and me, wholly, sacrificially, graciously, fervently and unconditionally. I'm devoted in thought, word, action and deed to building with you our marriage on the foundation of Christ. I'm loving and serving God with you, growing in our identities in Christ and together actively seeking his kingdom come. With great rejoicing, I praise God that I am blessed to choose you. <laughs> I choose to be your friend your mother, your co-explorer in this adventure of marriage. I choose transparency with you, sharing honestly in all that we are, our hopes, dreams, struggles, and our fears. I choose to be courageous with you, to suck all the marrow out of life with you, to do the things that scare us, to learn from each other, allow room for our mistakes, to say sorry, to forgive, and to faithfully choose unity whatever season comes our way. I choose unity with you on the peaks of ecstasy. I choose unity with you under the grind of mediocrity. I choose unity with you through the valleys of sorrow. I choose unity with you in the joy of Christ that is our strength. And no matter what shape our lives take, at the end of each day, I will faithfully choose with sincerity of heart to say, I love you. Oh. Wow, that was awesome. Tom and Justine, you have both given yourselves one to the other in marriage today, making a lifelong commitment of faithfulness and love in spite of tumbleweed hairstyles. <laughs> you will now exchange rings as a token of your commitment. May we have the rings, please? i get you to hold that, Tom. All right, you can take them out and uh, hand them to me. Wow. That's the dainty one, which is hers. Oh, no, that's mine. This is the chunky man <laughs> one, which is yours. The ancients used rings to symbolize eternity, an unbroken circle representing a promise that could never be broken. From precious metals that don't rust or tarnish with age, representing an eternal love that won't rust or tarnish with age. Tom, would you like to take Justine's ring, place it on her finger?
And would you repeat after me? I will. <laughs> Justine. <laughs> Justine. Justine. With this ring we marry. With this ring we marry. With all that I am, I love you. With all that I am, I love you. And all that I have, I give you. And with all that I have, I give you. This ring is my promise before God and these witnesses. This ring is my promise before God and these witnesses. Go ahead and place that on her finger. Justine, would you like to take this ring and place it on Tom's finger? And would you repeat after me? Tom. Tom. With this ring we marry. With this ring we marry. With all that I am, I love you. With all that I am, I love you. All that I have, I give you. All that I have, I give you. This ring is my promise. This ring is my promise. Before God and these witnesses. Before God and these witnesses. Tom and Justine, you can put that on the rest of the way. That's good. In the exchange of vows, in the giving and receiving of rings today, you have both sworn to be joined together in holy marriage. So with the authority vested in me as a minister of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, I now pronounce you husband and wife. <laughs> Thomas, David, Hines, Gilliland, you may kiss the bride. <laughs> Um, I, I know some family and friends came from interstate and, and outside of town. I came all the way from Springwood personally. <laughs> and that kiss was nowhere near good enough. You may kiss the bride. <laughs> Said, I, I love you to listen in, but I'm really going to talk to these two for a moment. So uh, the microphone will help with this. And when you asked me to uh, lead you in communion in, in, in the marriage ceremony, I was so honoured. And, and I think it's so amazing because we record in our scriptures the first great miracle of Jesus was that actually he was at a wedding. And he took those cisterns full of old water and they ran out of wine. But I know Ronnie's looked afterwards with this. This is not going to be a problem. Um, they ran out of wine and he turned it into wine and he created that incredible miracle and in that moment one of the most fascinating things was everybody at the wedding was blessed those who loved him those who were questioning him those that didn't know him everybody gets blessed when Jesus turns up and in this Christian marriage when people come in and see your marriage they will get blessed and so Jesus, who was a Jew, was in the middle of a Passover feast, their Jewish festival they did every year to remember their leaving Exodus, uh, um, Egypt, and to going into the Exodus of leaving that place. And part of that ceremony had all these incredible steps. And one of them, sitting here, which uh, you guys can see, is a bowl full of apple and parsley, symbolic of actually two interesting thoughts that which is sweet and that which is bitter I myself celebrate 30 years of marriage earlier this year I'm still on my honeymoon I love it, I love it and I want you to know but in those 30 years there is some tumbleweeds and there is some spectacular outshining of every plant in the garden truly beautiful and so I there's the reality of the two. So I'd love you to take a little bit of bread, just take some, and use that to just dip into the apple and the parsley. So just a small amount, otherwise you might. And just get that bittersweet taste in your mouth. And take that moment to remember, this is that parsley, the bitter and the sweet. Because marriage is about good, and it does have challenges. And you've already talked about that in your vows, and in what Pastor Ben has said, and we know that that is true. But this Jew, Jesus, 
in the middle of this incredible Passover, did something profound. Years earlier, he took water and turned it into wine. But on this, the night of which he was betrayed, he was about to go to his crucifixion and die. And three days later, rise again and transform everything. On that night, in the middle of that ritual, and why not in a wedding do this too? He took some bread and he broke it. And he said to his disciples, this is my body and it's given for you. And in marriage, as Pastor Ben's already talked about, this is the two becoming one. The yeast, the flour, it's all mixed together and now it's one. And the bread is symbolic of this body. And I want you to take another bit of bread for us. And I want you to give it to the other. And I want you to eat it. And I want you to realise... Um, and I want you to enjoy this moment. If we were in a Catholic church right about now, the miracle would be the fact that the bread represents the physical body of Jesus. The wine represents the physical blood of Jesus. If we were in a good Lutheran church, what we would have is at the point of eating the bread, the miracle becomes that the bread at the point of eating becomes the body. The wine at the point of drinking becomes the blood. But here at Hope, the miracle is that the wine becomes grape juice. So, <laughs> which is in accordance with insurance regulations. Nevertheless, this is symbolic, and that's what it is, of Christ's blood poured out for you to love this woman as he loved you. His blood was poured out. And in the same way, he said, take this cup, blood of my body, the new cup for you. And then he said something interesting. Years earlier at the miracle of the marriage of Canaan, he turned water into wine so everybody was blessed. And at this moment, he then said, you drink this, so I want you to drink it. Then he said to his guys there, I am never going to drink this again until that day when we will all be together in the marriage supper of the Lamb. And so every time you break this bread and drink this wine, we remember what he did on the cross. We practice it right now and we hold in tension that day when we will be with him again and we will party like there is no tomorrow. And for all of those of us who like to drink grape juice, it will be Grange and it will be damn good. <laughs> so allow me to pray for you if I may. Jesus, thank you for Tom and Justine for this incredible moment and that in this day, we do, we know where Tom lives, we know where Justine lives and we are going to hold them and we're going to encourage them and we're going to surround them and support them. And as we celebrate this communion right now, we are reminded of what you did right now until you come. Amen. Amen. Yeah.
It is my great privilege to ask you if you would like to be upstanding as I ask you to join me vociferously in welcoming the very brand new Mr. and Mrs. Thomas and Justine Gilliland. Go and, hug, go and hug your parents, that's what you do in this bit. <laughs>